Sometimes life takes a turn that just surprises me. And sometimes I can't see the reason why. So I'll just trust your loving hand to guide me and rest upon the grace that you supply. And he does. For you are God, the great I am, and nothing will I fear when you are near. I'm trusting in your loving hand. Your grace will work what's best in my life here. So if sometimes you don't understand the things you're going through, maybe you can't comprehend the reason why. Learn to trust in Jesus. He will see you through, and he will. He sees it's tear, he hears your every cry. Listen to me. Because he is God, the great I am, and you can trust his love for you. It's true. And everything is in his plan. His grace will work what's best your whole life through. His grace will always do what's best for you. Now I want to say this, okay, that doctors tell me there's about a 20% chance that uh, they're going to be able to shrink that tumor and cut it out. So uh, I'm happy about that 20% chance, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm going there, and I'm doing everything they say. I told them, let's be aggressive. They said, what if we make you sick? I said, lead on. They said, I'm, the doc says, he says, sometimes I push too hard. I said, you push. So we're going to do everything we can, okay? But our faith is in the great position, okay? And, 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 and whatever he decides is good, is good. But one thing I'm so grateful for, is that about 15 years ago, I decided to move my family to Murfreesboro, Tennessee and get a good pastor and get a good home church. And now, I thank you for it because your love is felt. And I praise his name for that. Now, I know the time is late. I ask you to be patient. I, I'm, I'm respectful of the time. I know a lot of us have to get up tomorrow and have busy schedules. I'm going to ask you to do two things. I, I have a message burning in my soul. And I'm going to ask you to do th two things. Please don't let any discomfort you may see in me distract you from the message. Don't let any discomfort you may see in me distract you from the message. The second thing is, for the next few minutes, if you just focus your full attention on this question, why don't I just make my life count for something? Why don't I just make my life count for something? Now, if you put the, the verse up there on the screen, I'd like everybody to read it out loud. Matthew chapter 16. Are we good to go? Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. If you all just read that out loud with me, uh, this is Jesus talking to the disciples. And so let's read the text. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Anything's worth anything. There's a price to pay. And Pastor, thank you for denying yourself. Thank you for the cross you carry. Thank you for following Christ. The next verse is, is something that we're going to focus on, and we're going to look at two lives that illustrate the next verse. But read the next verse, if you would, for me, with me. Verse 25, all together. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now, young people, I want to tell you, the old devil's trying to tell you that if you're going to save your life, you have to live for yourself. If you're going to save your life, if you're going to enjoy your life, if you're going to take your life to the maximum, you have to live for yourself. But I'm here to tell you in the authority of the Word of God, that's a lie. 
The, the scripture says if you try to do that, if you try to live for yourself, save your life, you're going to lose it. But then he says, if you lose your life for Christ's sake, he says you'll find it. I've got to think about life. What is life? You know, uh, uh, the average of someone with my diagnosis is 150 days. That's the average lifespan. So you've got to understand every day to me is precious. When I have a day, I can sit with the grandkids and love on them a little bit or, or love on my wife a little bit. Um, that's a precious day. You understand that when I, when I give somebody a day of my life, one of the very few that I may have left, that's a big thing. I'm giving them a, a whole piece of my life, a whole percentage of what I have left. So time is life. And then God's given everybody here talent. Uh, God's got a purpose for you only you can fulfill. No one else can fulfill your purpose. And uh, if we could advance the slide there to the, to the talent slide. There you go. Uh, God's given you uh, a, 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 a talent. By the way, you can use those talents for yourself. You can use those talents for this, this world and, and worldly gain. And you can take your time and your talent and you can earn treasure. And by the way, when we, the offering plate passes and we get to put our offering, after, that, that money that we're putting there is a little piece of our life. Because it, it was our time and our talent that we invested to get that, that there. And what the scripture is saying is if you want to spend your time and your talent and your treasure for yourself, you want to try to save it, you're going to lose it all. But if you're willing to say, no God, I'm going to live for you. I want to serve you. Here's, here's my time. Here's my talent, my treasure. You use it. I give it to you. Then, then the scripture says you're going to find that. And we're going to look at two lives in scripture that illustrate that so very clearly. Now, the first one we're going to look at is the Apostle Paul. Now there in, in, in the second book of Timothy, if you would please, um, to understand the context here, you have to understand the love that the Apostle Paul had for Timothy. Timothy wasn't just a young man to him. It was almost like a son in the faith. Someone he loved like a father loves a son. Okay? He'd, he'd seen, seen Timothy grow up. He'd, he'd coached Timothy. He'd mentored Timothy. He'd worked with Timothy a lot like Brother Kurt Copeland invested so much time in our kids when, when we were here. I have a debt of gratitude with you, brother. I could never repay. You know, the, and, and you know what? I, I, I can tell you they're putting fruit in heaven. When you get up there, you're going to be surprised and find people thanking you because of what you invested in, in the boys. And, and the fact of the matter is, that's what Paul did with the Apostle Timothy. And, and, and then he's, he's saying to the Apostle Timothy, he says, I don't have many days left. He says, I'm ready to be offered. I'm ready to go. And the time of my departure is at hand. By the way, it's interesting that he chose the words he chose because he didn't say the time of my death is at hand. And, and by the way, historically speaking, he was very close to the execution when he wrote those words. He had, he had a few days left. And he's writing to Apostle Timothy, and he says, uh, uh, the time of my departure, has, I just want to remind everybody here today, you too have a day of departure. Now just because I have cancer doesn't mean I'm going to beat you to heaven. You may still beat me, because nobody knows when that day of departure is. We don't know when that day of departure is. What I'm trying to say is that one day, everything that you have will either be in heaven or on earth. The Apostle Paul said departure. Now, that, that word departure, I was, uh, the, the, the week that Bobby Robertson had his departure, that same week, one of the heroes of Central America, Paul Marsh, the pastor knows him. He was one of the first missionaries to go to, to, to Central America to take the gospel down there. A hero. And, and, and he had his departure. And then Luis Ramos, one of the great men of God in San Luis Potosí, Mexico, his dad was down teaching uh, uh, couples retreat, had a heart attack, and died just within the three-day period. And, I, and I, I was out, I'm getting the news of, of these, my friends, my heroes that had their departure. And uh, I remember when I flew back to Nashville, I came into the, the airport, and, and see, God looks at death so different than, than you and I do. We look at death like, a, like an end, but God sees it as a beginning. We, we see it as a, as, a, as, as a departure. He sees it as a homecoming. You know, we see death as leaving the known and going into the unknown. God sees it like waking up and knowing for the first time of what's really true and seeing reality as it really is. And I was trying to think, I was, I was thinking about my friends and, and what it must have been like when they got to heaven. I came down those stairs at the, at the BNA airport 
and the escalator was broken. Now, as an evangelist, I always put books underneath, so I carry my, ro- my, my clothes up top and my computer. So I always had the suitcases. So I'm going down the stairs uh, by, uh, by foot, carrying those suitcases. I looked over to my left, and I saw a, a, a group of people, and by the signs, the homemade signs they were, they were holding, I knew they were waiting on a soldier boy coming back from the war. Okay? And so as I'm walking down the stairs, I begin to surmise within myself. I said, that, that looks like it's probably the wife, and those must be his kids. And then I said, that lady right there, she's probably the mom, and, and that's probably the dad. And, and I got about halfway down the stairs, and all of a sudden, the soldier appeared at the head of the stairs behind me. And I wish, you, I, wish I, I, I had a video to show you of the jubilee that broke out, <laughs> of the joy that broke out. And, 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 and the wife, she forgot all about her sign. <laughs> <laughs> she, that sign hit the floor. And <laughs> she's running up those stairs. Those little kids running, Brother Kramer, said, Daddy, Daddy, you know. And, and then I saw Mama was crying over here, and she's hugging Daddy. And, 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 and it occurred to me, that's probably what it was like when Brother Bobby set foot in heaven. And I don't know when it started. I really don't know when it started because I don't remember starting. But I looked down, and I'd set my suitcases down, and I was clapping. And I looked around the airport, and everybody was clapping, Pastor. Everybody's clapping because a soldier boy's coming back from the war. You see, and God looks at that very differently than we do. So this is a veteran. I want to tell you something. Apostle Paul didn't have to give his life to Christ. He didn't have to suffer all those beatings and the pain that was so often frequent in his body. He didn't have to be stoned and left for dead. He didn't have to be jailed. He didn't have to suffer the shipwrecks. He didn't have to do that. But he chose to do it because he said, I'm going to give my life to God. I'm going to serve my God. So I want you to see this. Uh, Look, if you would, please, the next slide here. You're going to live for the temporal, or you're going to live for the eternal. And I'm standing up in front of you tonight, but inside I'm down on my knees, and I'm begging you, especially the young people. I'm here to beg you. Make your life count for something. I beg you, use your life for eternity. I'm here to beg you to beseech you to not waste your life. The Apostle Paul was able to declare with pride to his son of the faith. Look at this next verse. You're going to like this. He said, son, I want you to tell you something. I'm about ready to go, but I'm, I'm finishing well. And Pastor, I can wish no greater desire for you that, that, that you finish well. You know, when you stand there before he who counts and you hear him say, well done, you're going to look over to the side, you're going to see me over there, I'm going to be Baptocostal. I'm going to be shouting glory, hallelujah, because, you know, it's not how you begin that makes or breaks you. It's how you finish that makes or breaks you. And I ask y'all to help me pray that I'll finish well, okay? And I got to tell you, honestly, I believe I'm going to finish well, but a long time from now. I believe they're going to take care of it, okay? And, and, and I really do. I don't know where that confidence comes from, and I'm not prophesying. I'm not saying anything. I'm just telling you that for, uh, that, that some, some, for some reason I think that, that God's going to cure me of this. And if he doesn't, blessed be his name. Blessed be his holy name. But I tell you what, I want to fight the good fight. By the way, not the bad one, because so many of our colleagues are fighting the bad fight. He's fighting the good fight. He says, I finished my course. I've kept the faith. And then he says, and there's a reward coming to me. I want to tell you something. You cannot imagine the thing God has for you, the things God wants to do for you. You cannot imagine the rewards he wants to give you. You can't imagine it. And, and he says, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And he says, it's not just for me, it's for anybody else that chooses to serve God. Anybody else that chooses to lose their life for my sake, he says, they're going to get the same thing. Now we rejoice in that testimony, don't you? I think that's the desire of most of us here, that we would finish well. But in the same chapter, there's another man. Down in verse 10. Scripture says, Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world. See, Demas had a privilege that that I would have loved to have had. If if the Apostle Paul had said to me, Brother Dan, would you help me carry the suitcases on this missionary trip? I'd have said, thank you, Lord. I'd I'd gone out there. He was a companion of the Apostle Paul, and he had a ministry and and, and an ability. By the way, he could have had fruit in the salvation of the entire Gentile world. Apostle Paul was the Apostle of the Gentiles. It's an unimaginable eternal treasure that was waiting for him. And yet he chose to save his life. And the scripture says why he did it. It says the reason he chose to save his life was because he loved this present world. 
And there's not a person here, including your servant, including pastor, the most spiritual among us, that aren't living in this world. And this world does have an attraction. It's pulling on every one of your hearts. It's pulling on every one of your hearts. The scripture tells us about the world. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It said, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. By the way, young people, I want to remind you, uh, uh, James tells us that whoso desireth, wanteth, has a desire to be a friend of the world, has made himself the enemy of God. Some churches use the grace of God as a pretext to try to get closer to the world. They use it as a pretext to kind of let a loose rein on their fleshly desires. But the grace of God is not a reason for us to get closer to the enemy of God. It's a reason to get closer to Christ. And I thank God for a church that still preaches separation. I thank God for parents that love their kids enough to still hold those standards high. I thank God for a youth pastor that gives his life and his wife to teach our young people, stay away from that world because that world is so destructive. And then the next verse tells us what the world offers. What exactly did he offer? Demons. It says, for all that is in the world, here's what's in the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He said, none of that's of the Father. That's of the world. Now here's the thing. The old devil's going to try to get you to use your time and your talent and your treasure for pleasure. Lust of the flesh. We live in such a hedonistic, epicurean society and we're bombarded with this every day. Every television commercial, every show, every billboard as we ride, drive down, everywhere around it, it's saying, do what feels good. By the way, lust of the, lust of the uh, flesh, lust of the eyes, possessions. There's a lot of, lot of Americans that are seeking, seeking this. I don't understand it. You know, in New York City, they have a new phenomenon. They don't have enough places to store all their stuff. So I go up there to preach at the, first, uh, the, the, the Spanish Baptist Church there in Brooklyn, and I see these barges, these huge barges that they're putting out on the riverfront, and they, and they build them up with these air-conditioned storage units. And, 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 and the American people have so many things and they accumulate so many, so many things and, and then they don't have enough space for their things and so they have to go rent storage units and have places to store their things and they don't want to lose their things so they get insurance so, so their things are covered and then they try to get alarmed so nobody will steal their things and then one day they die and leave all their things here on this earth. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a Spanish joke. It's funny in Spanish. It may not be funny in English so. If, if it's not funny in English, would y'all y'all laugh anyway? Okay. <laughs> this is a Spanish joke. Said there was a fella, he he got, he got a nest egg of about fifty thousand dollars, and but he didn't believe in banks, so he kept it under the mattress. And he was excited because in his, in his old age he expected to get that money out and enjoy it. And then he found out that he was terminally ill. And he's on his deathbed, and he said to his wife, he said, "Wife, you, you know I love you." He said, "But that that money's very special to me, and I want you to promise me something. I want you to promise me." That when I die, you're going to bury that money with me. And she loved him, and she, she, she did. She said, okay, I'll, I'll bury it with you. Her friends told her, don't you be crazy. Don't, that is a foolish promise. Don't you dare keep that promise. That's, that, that's not what he would even want if he really thought about it. And, uh, but the, the funeral came, and she had a little wooden box, and she went up to the coffin. She put that wooden box right there in the, in the, in the casket with her, with the, her, her husband's body. And uh, then she turned around and walked back, and her friend said, did you do what we think you just did? And, uh, and, and she, said, uh, he said, she said, yes, I did. I told him I'd do it, and I did it. And they said, you're crazy. She said, not as crazy as you think. I decided I'd write him a check. <laughs> That's all I'm trying to say is, 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 that, is that you live for possessions. You came into this world naked. You're going to leave naked. You're going to leave them all. And you're not going to cash a check after you die. Some people live for the pride of life, prestige. I'm sad to say, even some people stand and sing and preach because they want to look good and they want people to like them. God help us from that. I, 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 we have a lost spot of conference in Maya country. And we, have a, we had the last conference, we had, we had over 500 Mayans that came out of the jungle. Okay? And, 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 and the Mayans, I wish you could hear them sing. 
it's got to please our Lord to hear those whose uh, voices, uh, whose ancestors used to sacrifice uh, virgins on the altar to the satanic gods. Now their descendants are singing praise to Jesus. That's got to please our Lord to hear that. And uh, Benjamin wanted to go see the Maya, the Maya in ruins. So Pastor Osael Kokon and his son, Benjamin and I, uh, after, the day after the conference before we went to the airport, we decided to go visit the ruins. So we went out to see the ruins, and the guide said, this is where the Mayan king used to sit. And uh, they had it all roped off there. And Benjamin, he, he asked the guide, he said, could I sit on the throne of the Mayan king? And, the, and the, the guide said, well, sure. And he took the ropes off, and Benjamin went up there, and he sat on the throne. He's sitting on the throne of the Mayan king looking around. I said, Benjamin, do you remember, where do you think the Mayan king is today? And he said, Daddy, I, I don't know for sure, but I, I'm, I'm going to imagine he's probably in hell. I said, why is that? He said, because I doubt anybody ever took the gospel message to him. I said, you're probably right. Because in his day, nobody had more prestige than the Mayan king. I mean, the kings of France, the kings of England did not have more power and prestige than the Mayan king. Then I asked Benjamin, I said, what about his empire? And Benjamin looks around and he says, Daddy, looks to me like it's all in ruins. All I'm trying to say is that fame and that power. Some people want money not to buy things. They want the money for the influence and the power it gives them, the prestige it gives them. But that's so fleeting. Because I want to tell you something, the devil is a liar. And if you try to save your life and spend your time, talent, and treasure on pleasure, I want to promise you, you will have misery. Because sin pays terrible. And you know, we say amen, but I don't know if everybody, everybody really recognizes the danger. You know, if I took a snake and I threw it right here on the second row among these young ladies here, I promise you there would be movement in the church. <laughs> these young ladies would surprise you with their athletic ability <laughs> as they jump benches and chairs because they recognize the danger of a snake and yet that sin is so much more dangerous than a snake, so much more destructive, so much more devastating. We have even Christian teenagers that are flirting with it. I wish you could see the tears I've seen this year in the eyes of believers just like you who decided to try to save their life and live for the lust of the flesh. And if you decide to live for the lust of the eyes and use your time, talent, looking for possessions and money and wealth and convenience here, I promise you poverty. Because one day you will leave it all and did you know the heaven's not, heaven's not the same for everybody? I don't know if you knew this or not, but there's degrees of punishment in hell. And there's degrees of reward in heaven. By the way, Christ said, don't lay up for yourself treasures here on this earth. We said, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. And there's some people that don't have any treasure in heaven. By the way, thank God for a church that is reaching out beyond where you know. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people have had a knock on their door with somebody to give them a John and Romans printed right here at Steeple Press, right back there, put together by these loving hands. Had that person tell them about Jesus and gotten saved and then disciple them in church. Those people are going to be up there in heaven thanking those that invested their time and talent and treasure. Said, let's do, let's do something for Jesus. Let's, do, let's make a big splash for Jesus as we go forward. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of families had that knock on their door. I don't know how many. And that's just one little drop of water. What, 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 those of you who are faithful here at this church, you're going to be amazed when you get to heaven. You're going to be like the little boy with the five loaves and two fishes with your mouth open saying, wow, God got that much out of my little lunch. Just amazing. You know, it's amazing how God can multiply what we have and what we do. And you decide to live for prestige, I'm going to promise you shame, dishonor. You know, Demas, I believe he's saved. I'm not 100% sure of that, but I'm, but I'm pretty sure. And if he is saved, I know I'm saved. So I'm going to see him. And here in the eternal word of God, it's recorded. Demas hath forsaken me. That's eternal. That's never going to be erased. Demas hath forsaken me. Can you imagine when we see Demas? The shame? And the dishonor? But I got good news. Christ said, if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. And this is, I, I, I'm not capable. Only the Holy Spirit of God can communicate the next few words I want to say to you. Don't listen to the lie of the devil. When you serve Jesus, you get it all. 
because you will have eternal happiness. And you do not have to wait to get to heaven for it to start. <laughs> it starts down here. There's a song we sing, There is joy in serving Jesus. It's a true song. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, Happiness is never found by looking for it. It's, it's stumbled over on the road of duty. As you're fulfilling your purpose, you're doing what God called you to do, one day you just say, I'm happy. And I can promise you, young people, your life will be very difficult. We live in a sin-cursed earth. I promise you, do not, do not listen to anyone who tells you it's going to be easy. It will not be easy. It's going to be difficult. But I can promise you that as you in purity and humility and obedience fulfill your purpose before God, you will be happy in spite of the difficulties. I promise you that. Eternal happiness. You don't have to wait to get to heaven for it to start. And eternal riches. And you don't have to wait to get to heaven for it to start. You know, the old devil says, you serve the Lord. You're, just not, you're probably going to die of hunger. You're going to have holes in your shoes. And it's just a lie. God takes good care of his servants. He does. You know, the fellow doesn't serve the Lord. He's got to take care of himself. But the guy serving the Lord, he wins two times because God takes care of him here and gets it there. You know what? In this society that we live you're probably going to have a roof over your head. You're probably going to have food to eat. You're probably going to have transportation, whether you serve God or not, probably. But I'll tell you what, if you serve God and you need it, it's guaranteed you'll have it. Guaranteed you'll have it. Eternal riches. When my daddy started Lost Spada, he took his inheritance, put it in the, in the ministry, and his friend said to him, said, you're crazy. Said, That's your money. My, uh, my grandfather had a thousand acre ranch out in Nebraska. So they sold that ranch, and, and he put it in the ministry. He called my sister Joy and, and myself, and he sat down, and he said, listen, kids, I want you to know, this decision your mom and I are making means that we're probably not going to leave you a lot of money. And by the way, he succeeded. <laughs> but he said, I'm going to promise you, son, I'm going to leave you a good name. And by the way, he succeeded. Amen. By the way, I'll tell you the truth. The Antichrist was going to be very disappointed what he finds in the garlic or lost spot of bank accounts because we get more, we print more. <laughs> I'm not going to leave a lot of money to my family either. But I'll tell you one thing, by God's grace, I sure want to leave him a good name. I want to share with you this. His friend said, you're crazy to do that. And he said, let's wait 100 years and see who's crazy. Hadn't been 100 years. Lost spot is 48 years old. And guess what? We already know Daddy wasn't crazy. We already know he wasn't crazy. An eternal honor. Oh, the Lord wants you to reign with him. Some are going to reign over a city. You're going to be the mayor. Some are going to reign over a group of cities. You're going to be the governor. By the way, be careful how you treat the, the person next to you. They may be your governor in the millennium. Okay? So you don't know. So, but the reality is, is that you can't imagine the honor of finishing as the Apostle Paul finished. Being able to say to the young man he loved so dearly, about ready to go, son, but I'm finishing well. I just want to close by reading the text. You would read it with me out loud, okay, all together. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Truer words have never been spoken. I want to say to you this. I'm so incapable of doing the work in your heart that God wants to do. I'm so aware that I'm incapable. But I know that the Holy Spirit of God can confirm in your heart, cause you to make the decision, to make the changes necessary to give your life to Jesus, 100%. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of preaching in my church here. Now, nobody looking. Is there anybody who would say in a little while the pianist is going to play? Maybe if you would look up, I surrender all, if you don't mind there. Um, oh, the pianist is going to play in, in a minute and, uh, but, but before she plays I want to ask you a question how many can say Brother Dan this message was for me and God has spoken to my heart and I'm making some decisions for Jesus right now could you raise your hand up high could you, wow wow what a blessing what a blessing oh I'm so delighted to see I pray for you young people I pray for you I'm so delighted to see so many of your hands raised I'm so delighted now, I, I want to say this. The call of God is not something mystical or mysterious. It's not when you're out in the forest and about 3 in the morning, a lightning bolt hits you, and all of a sudden you're called to be a preacher, called to give your life to serve God. That's not it. But the call of God is when God puts a desire in your heart to do it. He said, if any man desireth 
the office of a bishop. He desireth a good work. God puts that desire in your heart. God doesn't call everyone. And you're not a second-class Christian if God didn't put that desire in your heart. You're a second-class Christian if you try to live your life for this world. But I thank God for those of you who are faithful businessmen, faithful workers, helped us buy that paper and take those, those John and Romans down there and get to the families. I thank God for you. And I go and preach, and somebody has to help me buy the ticket, and the reward's the same. But please don't feel, feel like you're left out or a second-class citizen if God didn't give you that desire. But if he has put a desire in your heart to dedicate your life to serve him 100% full-time, to preach his word, if he's put that desire in your heart, then the first step is just to let your pastor know. First step is to let your youth pastor know. And just say to them, hey, I want you to know. And then you should go home and go to bed in the same bed, and get up tomorrow and do the same routine, go to school, do everything. Nothing changes. All you're saying to them is, I have that desire, and I need you to help me start getting ready. I'm going to tell you that's, that desire is not for anyone. But I do have a question tonight. Is there anyone here tonight that would say, Brother Dan, I do have that desire. And I've not told my family, I've not told my pastor, I've not told my youth pastor, but I have that desire. You say, I'd like them to know that. Uh, would you be so kind as just raising your hand? Is there anybody? God bless you, young man. I've been praying. God bless you guys. Raise it up high. Raise it up high. God bless you. God bless you. I have that desire. I haven't told my pastor yet. I haven't told my youth pastor. There's, there's many hands that are raised. Anyone else before I pray? Anyone else? I have that desire. There's a hand to my left. God bless you. There's a hand to my left. God bless you. Someone, I have that desire. I've dedicated my life full time to preach God's word, to be a preacher of the gospel. I have that desire. And I'd like my pastor to know. I'd like my youth pastor to know so they can start working with me, get me ready. Anybody else before I pray? I'm going to ask all of you just raised your hand. If you'd look up at me here. Go ahead and look at me. Those of you just raised your hand. I'm going to ask pastor if he would. Brother Kurt, could you come down here to the front? Y'all don't mind coming down here to the front? I'm going to ask you guys to do, to do this. Just come down, shake pastor's hand. Let him pray with you, okay? And, and let Brother Kurt know if, if God's told you that. If y'all wouldn't mind, just coming up, leaving your seat. Come on down to the front and let pastor know right now. Just go ahead and do that. And, and, you, and, and your youth pastor know. Go ahead and leave your seat and step up and just shake his hand and just let him know. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm going to wait just a moment. Yeah. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Uh -huh. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Anyone else? Amen. Y'all pray. Y'all pray. All they're saying now, now, now listen, this doesn't mean they're going to be perfect. If they fall, we're going to have to help them up. We're going to have to love them and mentor them. This means say, they're saying to the pastor, God's put that desire in my heart, and I, and I want you to help me get ready. I want you to help me get ready. I'm going to ask you all to stand. Everybody standing, please. And here's what we're going to do. Now, now, sometimes it's impossible and very difficult to get down to the altar. So if you can't get to the altar tonight, that's okay. We're just going to make an altar of the chair we're sitting in, okay? You don't even have to kneel. If God has spoken to you tonight, I'm going to ask you to, to either come to the altar as she plays the I Surrender All, or just to sit down in your chair there and talk to God and tell Him about it, tell Him, what, tell him the decision you made. If God's spoken to you. Now, don't sit down if God hadn't spoken to you, but don't stay standing if God did speak to you, Okay? Don't stay standing if God did speak to you. One more question before, before I, I, I would give the service to pastor. Does anybody here tonight say, Brother, Brother Dan, I'm not 100% for sure. If I died, I'd go to heaven. But I sure want to go to heaven. I sure would love for Jesus to save me. He said, I'd like to do that. I need to do that. If that's you, would you be so kind just to raise your hand up and down? I want to pray for you. Is there anyone here? We're going to sing a verse of song. If the Lord's speaking in your heart, you heard the message loud and clear. You come. Let's do business with